Great to see you today. A lot of things happening here at People's Church. You can meet Vana in the lobby today at the Hope Now table, as well as all the other things. I hope that you consider even this coming Saturday and the I Love My City Mega Serve Day. Maybe you can't be involved on a a regular basis here at People's Church, but this would be something where you could bring your kids and your grandkids and get a culture of serving and sacrifice that could be integrated into your family, and this would be a perfect opportunity to do that. There's something just about serving that is so rewarding, and you bless others, but it's something that is, happens inside of you is amazing. You're right? Is that right? So, Awesome. Great to see you. By the way, my name is Dale, and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else than right here, right now. And I hope you feel the same way. I love you and love being with you each and every week. We are in this series called Past Tense. Next week is the finale when we're actually going to share stories of people that have put their past behind us. But today, I want us to talk about the road back. So welcome all those that are listening on radio, listening on a podcast, listening and watching online. Great to have all of you with us, whether you're in Minnesota or Wisconsin or Florida, Washington, Idaho, you're in Oregon, you're in West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, you're in Miami, wherever you're at. Great to have all of you with us and all around the world and right here in the Central Valley. And those right here in the room, great to see you with us. If you would turn in your Bibles with me, let's get started in Psalm 51. Psalm 51. It's Psalm, the, the book of Psalms is in the center of your Bible. The Psalms are the songbook the, of the Hebrew people. These are songs that were sung And so we're going to look at song number 51, which maybe your Bible has it. At the very top of mine, it has a little few sentences that give you the context of the psalm. And this psalm was written by David, and it's a song that he wrote in response to his confrontation from his pastor Nathan that confronted him with his adultery and the murder that he had committed And in light of his broken heart and broken spirit, he wrote this song. We're going to be referring to the the story of David uh, along the way as we move into the the reading of this word. So I'm going to be using that story as a reference point. Are you there at Psalm 51 verse 1? Have I told you I love you? Okay. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Remember the context. He's just been confronted of his sin. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, verse 4, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Verse 7, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Verse 10, create in me a pure heart. Many songs even in our modern age have been written among this verse. It's beautiful. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will return back to you. Verse 14, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God my Savior and my tongue will what? Do what? Sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight, verse 16, in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of God's word. David, as you know, it was referred to even when Pastor Brad talked about 
getting past your failures in life and moving ahead. And you know that he has a past. He, although he was considered a man after God's own heart, he still had a past. And that past had to do with this story that this song is written about where he has he is looking down at a time of war. He looks down and he sees Bathsheba. He is lusts after her. He calls her to his palace and he sleeps with her and she gets pregnant all while her husband is at war. And along the way, he continue to, continues to make these poor decisions, these wrong, he takes a wrong road. And a lot of us in life, if we've lived long enough, all of us have taken wrong turns and made unwise decisions and decisions that would eventually bring ruin, harm to ourselves and to other people. Maybe that is in, in vast quantities, maybe that harm isn't so vast, but whatever else that we have hurt ourselves and hurt other people in the process. But we get on these wrong roads. It was back when I was pastoring in Wisconsin that I took my leadership team to Phoenix, Arizona for a conference. And I had lived in, Journey and I had lived in Phoenix, and so I, I had friends in Phoenix. And so I had a friend who was a, a, a race car driver that was an instructor at this high-performance driving school where they drove race cars. And, and I arranged with him that I'm going to take my leadership team and we're going to go down to this high performance driving school and we're just going to kind of, you know, take him in some cars, show him a few things. Just gonna, it's just going to be a really cool experience over the lunch hour they had, we had at this conference. So we all load up in the van and we get going. Remember, I've been here before. I've been to this place. I've been here numerous times. But along the way, when we were going down to the to this place, we should have kept on going south. I was driving. We should have kept on going south on the freeway, but somehow I got turned around and I started going west on the highway leading to L.A. But, you know, there's a lot of city out west of Phoenix, and so we start driving there, and we continue to go, and we continue to go, and I'm thinking to myself, by now, we should have seen the exit. And so I keep driving, and I'm thinking, what in the world? This is just not, and then we go past, we go past Goodyear, and we go past these, these communities to the west of Phoenix, and, I, and I'm, I'm almost to L.A. now, you know, and I'm thinking, where in the world? And all of a sudden, I realized I have taken a wrong turn, and I've gotten on the wrong road, and it's a terrible, terrible feeling. And so we spent the rest of the time driving back to the conference, and we were even late to that because the time we were on the road, we should have been at this high-performance driving school in race cars. So before I get into the psalm and break the psalm down for life-giving truths that it will give to us, I want to, I want us to, give, I want to give you a few lessons to those that are on the wrong road of life. And again, using David and Bathsheba in that story as a reference point. The first is this, to those of us who have been on the wrong road, that the time that we spend on lost is time lost forever. Right? You can't get that time back. We spent all the time driving when we should have been, we should have been in race cars, but we weren't. We never get... We never got to the place we were going, and all that time was wasted and lost. Isn't it interesting that when we get lost, you know what we usually do? We quicken our pace. I'm thinking, I want to see this exit that was going to be the exit that I want, and when I didn't continue to see it, guess what I did? I drove faster. I drove faster in the wrong direction. And that's what we do, isn't it? When we get lost our way, we quicken the pace and we move quicker to the places that we shouldn't be. So burn your calendar, smash your clock. Time will always be gone when you get lost. The second thing you need to understand is that others get hurt. If they don't get hurt, they get misled. I misled these guys. 
I know the scenery because I had been there before. I know all the scenery that it looks like to get to this high-performance driving school. They still don't know what that looks like. Because I led them on a wrong path. And it's not like, isn't it interesting that even when we mislead others, we're confident. It wasn't like, I think I know where I'm going. I'm not sure where this is. I was, I know exactly where this is. I know exactly where I'm going. I know, and that... And yet I misled them. And because of that, we lost an afternoon. Referring back to David, not only did he mislead many people, including his family around him, but he also hurt them. He led them astray. So he committed the sin of sleeping with Bathsheba and getting her pregnant. But then he committed immorality and murder, and yet he bounced back, actually, to get with God. He repented of his sin eventually. We read that in this psalm. He came back, and he bounced back. But how many know that even though he bounced back, so David's sons committed the same sins, and yet they never did bounce back. They followed in their father's footsteps. Although David repented, they never did. You have Amnon, who raped his half-sister. You have Absalom, who committed immorality, grab this, on a rooftop in front of all of Israel with David's wives and mistresses to show his rebellion against his father and the revolt that he wanted to lead. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, part of this story. This is the word from Nathan to David that said, You killed him, uh, Uriah is his name, with the sword of, of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house. Absalom was killed by Moab. You have another one of his son killed by another son, Solomon. David went down the wrong path, and eventually he would turn back and he would repent for his sins. But that was a path, grab this, friends, that his sons never took. And we've seen this in families, haven't we? We've seen this in lives where parents or grandparents can get to the place where I'm just going to live for myself and it doesn't really matter. I have my kids or my grandkids with me. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to live the way I want to live. And yet somehow they come to their senses and they realize what they've done and yet along the way they have misled and they've hurt their kids and their grandkids. And, they're, and I know families like this today. They live the life they wanted to live. They turn back to God, but their kids are still apart from God. Their grandkids are still away from God because of the impact that they had in their lives. Time is lost forever. Others are hurt along the way. And the third lesson of four is this, that once you've chosen a wrong road, you can't correct it by taking other roads. You get on a path and then you think, well, I'm on this path and I know it's the wrong path, so I'm gonna try to take this path and guess what? That's the wrong path as well. That we continue to make wrong decisions. David did this. He made wrong decision after wrong decision. He should have been at war, but he wasn't at war. He's tempted and then he's, he... He takes Bathsheba and he has an affair with her and that's a wrong decision. So now what he's going to do is he's going to call Uriah back from war, her husband, Bathsheba's husband, hoping that he sleeps. Now they're not supposed to do this. While everyone is at war and a soldier comes back, you don't, you don't sleep with your, your wife because other soldiers aren't, so you can't either. It's not until everyone comes back that you can do this. But he's hoping Uriah... Re- rejects that law and just comes back and that rejects that principle and he comes back and sleeps with his wife and then they will have a baby and Uriah will never know that it's not his. God will know, I will know, she will know, but he won't know. But the thing is, is he was loyal and faithful to David and he didn't sleep with his wife. He slept outside. So what does David do? Makes another wrong decision. He gets Uriah Inebri, he gets him drunk so that somehow then he will loosen up and then his morals will decline and therefore he will sleep with his wife and he still doesn't do that. So he makes another wrong decision. Okay, I'm still lost. I'm still on the wrong road. Maybe I'll take another road here. 
We all know, don't we, that the only way really to do it is to get back to the place where you got lost in the first place, right? Get back to the place where you went off track. Don't, don't make wrong decisions. Because now, David, what does David do is he says, well, if I can't do this, then I got to do away with Uriah. This trusted partner, military partner of his. So he says, he gives to Uriah a note for Joab, the general. And that note, Uriah is carrying a note that, essentially, that says to him, put Uriah at the front lines and then everyone else draw back and just see what happens. So Uriah was carrying his own death warrant as he delivered it to Joab, and Joab did. And he, but David knew that Uriah would be loyal and would not open a sealed note, and so therefore he never knew what that note said. Everyone goes to the front line. They come back. Uriah stays, and Uriah is killed. Wrong decision after wrong decision after wrong decision. We get on the wrong path, and we think, oh, I'll take another turn to see if this can kind of bring it back to even, and yet it doesn't. I, the words of my dad, the axiom that my dad always said to me in this moment of my, moments of my life like this was this, two wrongs don't make a right. Three wrongs, four wrongs, five wrongs, six wrongs, don't make a right. You've made a bad decision. Now, don't continue to make other wrong decisions thinking somehow that you can neutralize the pain that you are experiencing and the wrong and the shame that you, are, that you have experienced. The key is you go back to where you got off track because you... You can make one wrong decision, but don't compile other wrong decisions along with that. There's been times when, I, when, when a, a young lady would come to me and say, uh, I was with this guy, and we slept together, and now I'm pregnant. Now I feel I should marry him, and I'm going, pump the brakes, sister! Because two wrongs don't make a right. He doesn't treat you well in, in these, some of these scenarios. He doesn't treat you well. He's mean to you. He's, he's, ne he's neglecting you. He's even ignoring you now. And you think you should marry him? No. Don't. But, I'll, but I don't want my child to grow up in a, as a single parent, you know, without a father. That's better than having a slug as the father. Amen. Don't make one wrong decision and try to neutralize it with another wrong decision. Lady on her deathbed. Sometimes we just feel like I'm on the road. So the last thing I want to tell about is we begin to think, the last lesson is this, we begin to think there's no convenient place to turn around. I got to find now, I'm, I have to admit we're on the wrong road and, and I I have to say, we're, we're not on the right path. We're on the wrong road. I have led you astray. Now we have to turn around, and we can't find a place to turn around, and so we just have to keep going. In the, and we feel as though, you know what, since I'm on this road, I might as well just stay on this road. We had neighbors. We lived in, the, the, in one location. We had neighbors, and they weren't churchgoers. But they were just really nice people, and they took to us, Joni and me, and... They knew we were pastors, and, and then she got sick. And so he comes to me, and he wants me to, to pray with her. And so I, I go to her, and in front of me, he says to her, maybe this is a time you want to turn to God, honey. And she... Not even, with a, not even with a bitter spirit, she said, you know what? I haven't turned to God my whole life. I'm not going to start now. Your deathbed is not a place for pride, by the way. And you can feel, you can understand, and you could feel with me the hopelessness that I would feel in that moment of a person that says, you know what? I've gone down this road for my whole life. I might as well just continue to go down this road. We do it all the time, don't we? Maybe we get in a business partnership and we 
Don't see any way out of it. Couples know they shouldn't be living together before they're married, but they do. And so they're living together and all of a sudden their, their finances are together and their living conditions are such that they say, you know what, we know we, we should make the right decision, but we, we really, it's not convenient for us. It's not hard. We have so much going in this direction. So we just think, you know what, we're going to just keep on going this direction. I'm in this bed. I might as well just lie in this bed. You might die in that bed. David, it was months before he would ever come clean. And that's because Nathan, his pastor, would confront him. He, was, he had that moniker. Think of it. A man after God's own heart. Yet he would try to continue to cover that sin and not repent of it. Because he knew that if he'd repent, everything would have to be exposed and it would be dangerous. And he, he knew somehow, I, there's probably no way I can in any way reverse this. And he's right. Bathsheba would never regain her moral purity. Uriah would never come back to life. They had, a, they had a boy, and that boy, Bathsheba and David had a boy, and he was born, and seven days after he's born, he dies. That boy, no matter what he does, no matter if he cries all night, that boy is not coming back to life. But yet David, even though he was in a mess that he could not straighten out, there are decisions, friends, that we have made that we cannot straighten out. We can't undo them. There are words that we have spoken that we can't unsay. There are decisions that we can't unmake, but we can still understand that with God's help, we can have the courage to take steps forward because David craved a new beginning. He craved a fresh start. And although he couldn't straighten everything out, he knew that God could be at work in his life. And he writes this song. He would take, he would understand that even though I can't undo what I've done, God in his love and in his grace will forgive me and take my ugly past and make it new again. And friends, that's the same hope that you have, that I have. I'm speaking to, to ladies that have had an abortion and you, and, and you think in terms of this is how old they'd be right now, and I wonder what they'd be doing, and I wonder how, what personality they would have. And you continue to have that cloud hanging over your head. There is a new beginning for you. There are those with abuse and addiction. There are those that have had divorce and adultery attached to your life. There are those that have had immorality. There are those like Ivana Inn who have had murder attached to their life. You have prison time. You have crime. You have things that have taken place. And friends, no matter what people see around you, I'm telling you today that David's path can be your path and there can be a fresh start and a new beginning to starting today. So let's look. Let's look at David's path because David's path is our path to a new beginning. Psalm 51, starting at verse 1, that we read, let's just take this, because it begins the first step back for David as he writes this song in the midst of his terrible sinful choices. It's the mercy of God. It's the mercy of God. Have mercy on me. Verse 1, have mercy on, do you see it? Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Have mercy Mercy. Lord, even though I don't deserve it, don't give me what I deserve, but I need you to do a favor for me in light of what I don't deserve. The mercy of gra gra grace is he gives us what we don't deserve, and mercy is he, with, he doesn't give us what we do deserve. Lord, have mercy on me. Do me a favor and hold this back, Lord. Please, please have mercy on me, and God does have mercy on us. Look at this. According, have mercy on me. What? According to your, he's reminding God of his unfailing love. Maybe your Bible says loving kindness. Uh, my Bible says unfailing love. Maybe your Bible says uh, 
your Bible says that you it could say loving kindness. It could say it could say unfailing love. The, the Hebrew idea is loyal love. This is a love. This is a familial type of love. This is that that parental type of love. Lord, according to your loyal love to me, your love that never fails. That even when I don't love you, you love me. That even when I'm not, I'm, I'm not, my heart isn't toward you. Your heart is always toward me. Lord, I have been in these moments when my, I have been distracted and sin has distracted me and my immoral choices have been the path that I have taken and yet you have never turned your back on me. Lord, your loving, your loyal love to me is always there. You have this unfailing love, Lord. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. This word compassion, the Hebrew word has the same root word as the root of the word that says it's a womb. So this has the idea of, Lord, you're going to treat me like a parent treats a newborn. The kindness. Well, how do they treat it? Think of it. Think of it in your mind. Get the image. The gentleness. The way they talk to the newborn is kind, it's soft, it's gentle. Lord, according to your great compassion for me, that he takes us in his arms with tenderness and care because of his mercy and his love for us, he has compassion on us. It all, the foundation of it all for you and me is the mercy of God. And then the next step is, The forgiveness of God. The forgiveness of God. Let's keep on reading. Are you still with me? Yes? For you know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. I I have a realistic view of all that I've done. And I'm not denying it and I look it square in the face. And then he says, verse 4, against you, you only... Have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight? Now I read that, and my first thought is, he says, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. And my first question is, hold it. Hold it. Do you read it like this? Hold it. What about Bathsheba? You sinned against her. What about Uriah? You sinned against him in so many ways including murder. What about this child that's born? What about your family, David? What about the nation that you lead, David? Didn't you sin against them as well? Do you get my thought here? It's, so I'm, I'm focusing on this, thinking about this, going, why does he say this to you and you only? He emphasizes it. To you and you only, against you and you only have I sinned. Well, David's a good theologian. And David understands, now I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to get, David understands that all sin is against God. Ultimately, all sin violates God's character, God's nature, and it is an affront to God and it's an offense to God. All sin is... In the process, we offend other people, but all sin is against God. It, it offends him and therefore puts a continued distance between us and God. All sin is this violation against God. So to you and you only have I sinned. The, the, friends, listen. This phrase gives you and me hope. Can David bring Uriah back to life? To get restoration. Yes or no? Uriah is dead. Maybe the person that you need to forgive is, is gone. Maybe they reject your phone calls and they ignore your text and you can't get a hold of them and you're trying to make restitution because should we, should we, have we sinned against the people that we've hurt? Yes. Did David sin against Bathsheba? Yes. Did he sin against Uriah? Yes. Did he sin against his family? Yes. All of these people. But he's saying, ultimately, Lord, to you, it's, against, it's all against you because what David recognizes is he can't, 
He can't bring Uriah back. He can't get this boy that was born out of wedlock back. He can't get them back, and yet he still needs to be restored. He still desires a fresh start. And so David is saying, even though there are circumstances that I can't reverse in terms of others, I have hope because the supreme lawgiver, the one who can ultimately forgive me, is willing to forgive me. How many of us know that when we hurt somebody else at times, they say things like this, I will never forgive you. Does that mean you can't put your past behind you? It can't, right? There are people that maybe cannot, but there are those people that will not forgive you for what you've done in light of that. But that doesn't mean that you can't have ultimate forgiveness because it's to, against God that you have ultimately sinned. And he, being the one that has been ultimately offended, is the one who will ultimately forgive you whether others can or won't against you and you only have I sinned. So therefore, I want to tell you this. Put it up, up on the screen for me. And that is if your future is dependent upon another's forgiveness, you will never break loose from your past. If you think you have to get another person's forgiveness that they may never forgive you, then you will never break loose from the darkness of your past. Friends, this is hopeful. God against you and you only, even if they never forgive me, thank God, Lord, for your mercy, your unfailing love, and your compassion that you do with a broken heart, with a contrite spirit. You will and can forgive me. I love these words that David uses throughout this hymn. Verse one is blot out my transgressions. Verse two is wash me. Verse seven is purify. Verse nine is hide your face from my sin. Ultimate forgiveness is ours. We are guaranteed, he says, as far as east is from west, east, east is from west, is as far as I've removed your sins from you. You know why he doesn't say as far as north is from south, right? Because if you go north on a globe, guess what? You will eventually go south. And if you're going south on a globe, you will eventually go north. So actually north and south aren't that far from each other. But if you go east, you will forever go east. And if you go west, you will forever go west. And the two will never collide. As far as east is from west, I have removed your sin from you, is what God says. Even though others won't or can't forgive you, you can receive forgiveness from the ultimate forgiver, the one you have ultimately offended, and that is God himself. To you and you only have I sinned. The next step is the transformation of God. Verse 10 says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. This creative, wonderful, creative working power, this is the same word that the whole worlds were created, that God has this creative power to transform us, to take the, to take the, the, the caterpillar and make it, transform it into a butterfly is the same one that can take our ugly past and turn it into a new beginning and a fresh start. The transforming power of God. He, I love these words in verses 10 through 13. Create, renew, restore, and sustain me or uphold me. I love these words. that David knew that even though his circumstances can't change, God can change him. That even though the things in my past I can't undo, God can undo me and change me into the person he wants me to be. The creative power. And this is all seen even in this transformation is seen. Look at verses 14 and 15 when he says, Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, his murder, O God. You are God, my Savior, and my 
tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Because now he again realizes the mercy and the forgiveness of God. It starts to transform him, and that transformation is seen through his praise and worship of God. Isn't that the very foundation of every time we open up our mouths and we sing praise on a Sunday morning or even on a weekday by ourselves, that the foundation of it all is the mercy and the grace and the compassion and the love of God who ultimately forgives us and that we say, God, I wouldn't be where I am without you. Vana, Vana In wouldn't be where he is without the forgiveness and the grace and the transforming power of God. Every one of us are in that same road, right? Isn't it interesting? So when we've had te- the Teen Challenge group here, you know, if you've been around when we've had Teen Challenge, this, this in Reed, we have the Central Valley Teen Challenge, and we know when they're here, there is an energy of worship that is there. Why is that? Because they know all too well how God has taken their past and removed the shame of their past and given them a brand new day. Maybe... Maybe our praise is weak because our condemnation is so strong. Maybe our praise is weak because the experience of God's grace is weak in our lives. Israel continued to look back on where they were so that they could appreciate where they were going in the same way. Can we get a renewed sense? Restore to me the joy of your salvation. How many need to have this joy of salvation restored to them so that we can open our mouths and declare his praises? Lastly, the providence of God. The providence of God. Bathsheba did move in. And they would have another son, and his name was Solomon. Wise, one of the wisest men ever, wrote many of the Proverbs that you have in your Bible. He built the temple that that David had always dreamed of building. David didn't get to, but Solomon got to. Wisest man ever. He asked for wisdom. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. He's the wisest guy ever. Do you think it has escaped him to put the dots together to know that if his dad would have lived a righteous life, he would have never been born? Make sense? Do you think he was smart enough to connect those dots? I should have never been born. And yet he was, in the providence of God, he was born. And David and Bathsheba and Solomon are all part of the line that brought us our Savior, Jesus Christ. Does God get confused because of your past? Is God thrown off or messed up because you, oh, he, he hears about your past. He sees your past and goes, oh, man, what am I going to do? Is that what God does? You say, yeah, but look at my past. Does God go, yeah, look at your past. Wow. (laughs) No. He's not messed up by it. It doesn't confuse him. It doesn't throw him off in any way, shape, or form. He loves. It's his business to take our mess and make it beautiful. I was rereading the Judges this week, and I got to Judges chapter 11. I was reading of Jephthah. And I'd forgotten about Jephthah, one of the judges. Jephthah was born, verse chapter 11, verse 1, Judges. He was born, his dad was Gilead, but his mom was a prostitute. And verse 2 tells us in Judges 11 that because of this, illegitimacy to him, he was kicked out of his family. So therefore, he, he's in the foster care system. He's, he's not, this is not good. He has to grow up with other people, other people caring for him. And, and yet, by the end of Judges 11, grab this, the Bible says that upon Jephthah, illegitimate Jephthah, Mother is a prostitute Jephthah. 
The Bible says of him, the spirit of the Lord came on him and all of Israel asked him to lead them into battle. That's what God does. I want to encourage you. At the beginning of this year, there was an art exhibit in the airport at Istanbul. And the art exhibit, let me show you, the, let me show you this is what the art exhibit looked like in Istanbul's airport. What took place was they got this idea that they took all of the solid waste that the airport had taken and they turned it into art. Next picture shows you, these are all, these, you know, the thin, the thin cardboard boxes that you get a lot of products in. This is, this is the scraps of those boxes, those thin cardboard boxes made into that beautiful image. The next picture is just simply waste paper, paper that has been thrown away, turned into that beautiful piece of art. Next picture, last picture. That picture on the left, that's all bottle caps that were thrown away. All bottle caps. You can go online and look at close-ups of all of these images. But the point is that what someone calls waste, another person calls art. And people may have called you, you and your existence a waste of time and your life just a waste. You may even think of your own life as a waste, but God doesn't see it that way. He sees you as a great piece of art. When others, when others would want to discard you or you'd want to discard yourself, God says, nope, you are my, Ephesians 2.10, you are my workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And that word workmanship, as you know, is the word poema in Greek, which means my poem, my piece of art. However you see yourself, God sees you as his artwork. And so you today can have a fresh start and a new beginning. It doesn't mean that your past is erased. It means that your past is going to be redeemed. The very thing you want to get rid of is the very thing God wants to recycle. And turn it in to the very trophy of God's grace and compassion and love and mercy. And that place that we come back to, we don't keep on taking wrong roads. We just come back to the place where we got off track. And that place, my friends, is the cross of Jesus Christ. Where we first received forgiveness. Thank you, Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, there are those in this room, maybe for the very first time, maybe the, they've been here just a few weeks or a few months, they've never made that decision to follow you, to allow you to forgive them of all their past and give them a fresh start, a brand new day. Thank you, Lord, for the people that I know in this room and look at across this room and know in our congregation that you've already done this work. You've already taken and you've given them a brand new start. You've given them a brand new beginning because of their relationship with you. So create in us, Lord God, a pure heart. Recreate a pure heart. Don't cast us away from but Lord, restore unto us the joy of your salvation. Don't take your Holy Spirit from us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the fresh starts, the new beginnings that all start at the cross of Jesus where we again say, I receive the forgiveness that God has for me. And Father, I know that you have me covered in Jesus' name. And no matter what I've done, no matter where I've been, no matter how I've Pastors and counsel, you come to the front of the room as we all stand together.
covered. Covered. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Can we just let condemnation go and be free just to take a moment and just praise him right now and just thank him for what he's done in our lives to take our past, our mess that we've made, the disastrous choices and turn them into a piece of his glory, a trophy of his grace. Will you just thank him right now? Just thank him right now with your voice. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing over you in just a moment. Maybe today you've made a decision to follow Jesus, to have a brand new start, a fresh beginning in your life. I, I have some information for you. It's on a QR code if you want to use, use it with your camera here in this room, and that will give you information on what your next steps are in your walk with Jesus. You can get the same information in our VIP room where you can ask them and they will give you some instructions. It's not about people search. It's about your relationship with God and what your next step is. There are people at the front of this room that would love to pray with you. There's a miracle waiting here and I wouldn't want you to miss a miracle of seeing your life start over again, a fresh start, a brand new beginning. These people would love to pray with you over any and all issues that you may have or maybe it's someone near you. But don't, don't leave a miracle on the table, friends, right? Don't, don't, do, don't leave any unfinished business with God. And then I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing. And as we conclude, you can make your way to the front of the room or you can go loving each other. But will you get in a posture where I can speak a prayer of blessing over you before we leave today? Father, in Jesus' name, these hearts, these lives, these are just saying, we want all that you have for us, Lord. So, Father, I just speak blessing right now. I speak in Jesus' name the blessing of your face shining upon us and your grace being known in our lives. Lord, I speak, Lord, of the blessing of your mercy, your grace, your loyal love to us, and that we, your mercy would overflow unto our lives in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I speak of the blessing now from this moment on of the guidance of the Holy Spirit that he would guide us to make great decisions, godly decisions, wise decisions. Father, I speak the blessing of the fear of God upon our lives, that it doesn't matter what others think and say around us, we want to please you. Lord, I speak in Jesus' name that you would overflow our lives and that in our rising up, we would sense and know your presence and your love, your guidance and your protection. Lord, in our rising up, you would give us great influence to those around us. And in our lying down at night, you would give us not just sleep, but you would give us rest. I speak healing in this place. I speak peace in our families, and I speak prosperity in our businesses and in our skills and in our labor. And Father, I speak that you'd give us great health, godly friends, and God's very, very best upon our lives. And I pray this for the glory and reputation of Jesus Christ all around us. And everyone said amen. amen. I love you guys. God bless you as you find a place to pray, or you go loving each other. See you next week. I love you.